Welcome to Beyond the Lab, a series by the Office of Career Development in the Biomedical Research, Education, and Training Department of the Vanderbilt School of Medicine. I'm here today with Harold Olvey. Harold got his PhD in 2003 in the Department of Pharmacology, and we're glad to have you. Thank thanks, you. Thanks glad for being be here. here. Absolutely. Um, so tell us what you did here at Vanderbilt. So I was a graduate student here. As you said, I got my PhD in pharmacology in 2003, and I worked for Joey Barnett, who's still on faculty here in pharmacology. And the research I did when I was here was looking at the regulation of coronary vessel and heart development, primarily by the growth factor TGF-beta. Okay. And so what have you done since you've gotten your PhD? What's your path? So I have... I continued in research. I went into a research postdoc after I left Joey's lab, uh, moved to Chicago, and continued working in coronary vessel development, but decided to change model systems, which I think is a very important thing to do as you train to get as broad a base as possible so that when you are ready to go into that more permanent job, you have a basically a bigger set of tools. Sure. You want to make your toolbox as full as possible. So I deliberately chose a postdoc where I could work on a new model system and I could do different sorts of experiments. Whereas here at Vanderbilt, I had w primarily worked on growth factors and external signals. In my postdoc lab, I worked primarily on genetic regulation. Okay. And so you had to learn about different things. It forced me to learn new techniques, think about things differently. But then when I was ready to go into a more permanent position, I had all of this information to pull from. And it's been very helpful. Okay, so tell me what you do now. So now I'm an assistant professor of biology at Indiana University Northwest. The IU system has several regional campuses, one of which is in Gary, Indiana, which okay. is where mine is. And we serve mostly the local population. My particular institution has about 5,600 students. Many of them are first generation. Uh, many of them are underrepresented minorities. So we have a, a very uh, woman-dominated campus. We also have many Latino students and African-American students. Um, and what I do now is primarily teach. I do have a research component to my job. It is technically 25% research. Of course, on any given day, it could vary anywhere from about 0% to 100% research, and the teaching is the same way. Um, but it's a fun job, and I really enjoy interacting with my undergraduate students. I'm lucky enough to have some who I interact with in the classroom, others I interact with in my own laboratory during research, and many I interacted in both places. Okay, so how is your role a good fit for you? It's a good fit for me because I've always liked the teaching aspect of my job. Even when I was at Vanderbilt, I really enjoyed working with undergraduates here. We would have undergraduate students, both from Vanderbilt and other institutions, come through the lab, especially in summer. You sure. know, that was a popular time for students to sort of get their feet wet in research. And so I enjoyed teaching them, working with them. Same in, as a postdoc when, of course, I was working not only with undergraduates, but the graduate students, helping them with their experiments, helping them write their papers, their dissertations. And I had a real flair for teaching. Um, and so when I was thinking about a permanent position, I thought I'd really like to do something where I can still research because I've always enjoyed research and I didn't want to give that up. I wanted to be active in training the next generation of scientists as well as medical professionals. A lot of the students I see aspire to careers in research, in medicine, in allied health professions, such as pharmacy. So I really like the fact that I'm helping to educate them. I'm helping to show them what it's like to work in the profession and what it's like to have sort of a mastery level knowledge of the subject area that their professions are going to demand. So what surprised you in your first year as you started your faculty, your transition into mm -hmm. being a faculty member? I think the most surprising thing was how much time it took to get things prepared for teaching. Everyone tells you it's going to take a long time, but until you actually do it, you're really not prepared. My institution had really only recently before my hiring changed their policy so that in your first year, rather than having what we call a 75-25 load, where 75% of your effort is teaching, 25% is research, they changed it to a 50-50 load in your first year. But that's one of those years where really teaching was about 90% of what I was doing, at least in terms of my time. Sure. Because when you're developing courses from the ground up, which I really had to do in many cases, there's nothing to rely on. You have to come up with those materials. You have to figure out the best way to present it. And what I didn't want to do was be the person who came in and just took what was already there. You know, sure, textbook publishers make pre-made PowerPoint presentations, but what am I adding to that? I wanted to make sure that I was bringing my own 
wealth of knowledge, my own research as well, which I use as examples for teaching. So I wanted to make that personal because I wanted the students to really understand the material. And I felt that I could only do that if I invested the time to make the material something that I thought students would be interested in. And so that just took a lot, a lot of time. Okay. So what skills um, from your PhD training did you use as in your current role? Sure. So I still do research. So in my laboratory every day, I'm doing experiments involving basic biological techniques like PCR, quantitative PCR, running agarose gels. That sort of mechanical thing is certainly something I learned while I was here. But also, I have to formulate research questions. And of course, that's the biggest part of my PhD training. You have to know how to do the experiments in order to answer the questions. But the more important thing is to know how to ask the question and then how to design experiments best to answer it. And so that's where a lot of my training, both from Vanderbilt and in my postdoc, comes into my day-to-day -day practice. As I think about where I want to go next with my research, as students bring me data, where should we do or where should we go next? What's the next thing we need to do? And all of that I learned really as a graduate student and as a postdoc. Okay. So what skills did you have to gain in your new role? The big skill I had to gain was really learning how to lecture. As a scientist, and especially at Vanderbilt in pharmacology, I received excellent training on giving presentations. I was very well prepared, I felt, leaving Vanderbilt to go in front of my colleagues, my peers, and present my original data. But that's different than presenting to students. It really requires you to step back and think, okay, what are the things I know so well? I know like the name of my parents, the name of my siblings, that these students have never heard of, that they have no idea when it comes off my tongue what I'm talking about. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of thought to put yourself back in that position you were in before you knew this to the level that you would need to, to earn a PhD in the field. And so learning how to lecture, learning how to present the material without spoon feeding, still challenging the students and developing critical thinking skills. It's something that I'm increasingly seeing a pro as being a problem in my student population. I feel like when they come to college, they haven't been taught to think critically. And we have to somehow engender that skill because without it, the degree is meaningless. Okay. So what would you encourage current trainees um, to pursue if they're interested in your path? Sure. Well, I think having a postdoc is essential. Um, it's very rare to find an institution that will hire you, especially in biological sciences, if you don't have some postdoc experience, um, especially if you want to do research as part of your uh, as part of your job, like mine is, I think a postdoc then is absolutely required. But when you're looking for a postdoc mentor, you might want to look and see where her trainees have gone. If all of her trainees have gone to R1 research institutions and you're more interested in a teaching career, that may not be the best fit for you. I was very lucky that my postdoc mentor, towards the end of my time in his lab, allowed me to explore opportunities, adjunct teaching um, as one example, that gave me the experience I needed to be effective and competitive when I applied for my faculty position. Okay, great. So how do you network? Great question. So I hate networking. <laughs> I, I consider myself to be an extrovert, but one of the things I hate to do is sell myself. And, I, and to me, that's sort of what networking feels like, right? It's weird to say that as someone who writes grants, and I've been reasonably successful with my grant writing because essentially in a grant, you're having to sell yourself. But at least with a grant, I'm selling my ideas. I don't mind selling those. But networking sometimes feels like you're selling yourself. And so that's what I tend to do when I'm networking. I think to myself, I'm not really selling myself. I am selling my skills, my connections, and I'm trying to make myself valuable to the other person. So when I network, I keep that in the back of my mind. I am trying to show this other person that I might be valuable to them, and they might also be valuable to me. When I network, of course I introduce myself, but then I try to find out something about the other person. I try to find some sort of commonality. For instance, I just went to a meeting in Indianapolis about scholarship of teaching and learning. And while I was there, I met some great faculty at the other IU regional campuses, one of whom has taught a course for 30 years that I'm teaching for the first time this summer. We were able to connect over that. We've shared emails. 
we're talking about things in the course. I'm doing things differently than she is. She's doing di things differently than I do. So we can learn from each other. And so that's been very valuable, just w being willing to put myself out there, learn about the other people, and always carry business cards. That's so important. Okay. Because it's still, most people still want a card. They don't want you just to aim their phone, aim your phone at them and, and shoot them your contact. They want that card. Okay. So tell me about your work-life balance. What does that look like? Mm. You know, it's never ideal. It's uh, this is not a this is not a career path for someone who wants a nine to five job. It just really isn't. Um, the nice thing about my career is that I don't punch a clock. Now, when you're teaching, of course, you are there. You know, before the lecture begins, and you're there after the lecture ends. And I have office hours, but during my office hours, I might be in my lab. You know, I might be doing a procedure down the hall. I always let my students know where I am. I'm always answerable to them. But outside of those times. I do have a lot of control over my schedule. It's not that there's not work to do, but I have control over when it gets done to some extent, more than somebody who works in a job where they have to be there from nine to five because that's when the boss is in or that's when the other support personnel are in. And I have the flexibility of choosing when I want to do certain things. You know, I can take a block of time when I'm not teaching and say, you know what, this week I'm doing research. Other times I can't do that. Other times the teaching load takes that over. In terms of working in things outside of work, the life balance aspect of it, that is also a little bit challenging. And I've had to get creative about when I work, you know, working hours that maybe don't fit my personality best, but fit my life balance best. So that I leave a little earlier in the morning, but that way I can get home a little earlier at night. But it is challenging. It's definitely not a career where you can go in, put in your 40 hours and you're done. I do a lot of work from home. And that is one nice thing is uh, a lot of my teaching responsibilities in terms of the administrative side can be done at home, can be done in my office. Um, but the research, obviously, that happens in my lab. It's very hard to set up a research lab at home. <laughs> Lots of paperwork you just don't even want to fill out. So it's just not worth it. OK, good to know. Um, so what words of wisdom would you give current trainees um, as they begin their job search? If you're just finishing your PhD, again, if you want to go into a career like mine, I strongly encourage you to seek, to seek a postdoc. And the words of wisdom I would give you, like I said before, find someone whose trainees have not all gone the same path. Okay, If they've all gone to research, that may not be the best fit for you. Look for a postdoctoral mentor who has students who have gone on to more research, or more teaching type jobs versus just the research. Um, if you're a postdoc and you're looking for a job, I would absolutely encourage you to find adjunct positions. Work with your PI. Let me tell you, adjuncts are great for us who are you know the permanent faculty in the institution because there are labs, there are courses that meet from six at night to nine at night, and you know exactly when I don't want to be teaching from six at night <laughs> to nine at night. <laughs> That's when we hire adjuncts. Those are great opportunities. It doesn't even have to be precisely in your field. My first adjunct teaching job was environmental science. I was learning along with the students, but I knew the biology well enough that I could learn it and I could teach it to them effectively. So don't be afraid to look for adjunct positions that are slightly outside your specific field of interest. But get that, get that experience. That teaching experience is really critical, and I'm sure that's really what gave me an edge when I was looking for my position and when I was eventually awarded it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate Absolutely. having you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me.